this was a really key time in history because the countries were lined up to come up with a major legally binding agreement on climate. So we felt that we really needed to organize the oceans community to have a big voice and to have a big impact at COP21. So together with the Sasakawa Peace Foundation and 45 other co-organizers, we mobilized a big effort. And they were six governments, the main United Nations agencies, uh, academic institutions around the world, and the biggest or the most important ocean non-governmental organizations. So it was very hard to first mobilize all those organizations, and of course they have a little bit of different views, you know, so, you know, it's always very difficult to balance all the views and to come up with a package of recommendations uh, that makes sense. Uh, so that was a challenge, but it worked well. Uh, the second one, of course, is that we wanted to involve really high-level political leaders, presidential level, you know, heads of state or ministers. And in fact, we were able to get about 30 high level, including the Prince of Monaco, including the President of Palau, the ministers in, from France, uh, Papua New Guinea, you know, many other uh, ministers or ambassadors. And also the heads of the UN agencies, like the head of UNESCO and, and so on. And then what we wanted to do too, we organized a, um, a an international expert working group of about 36 colleagues from around the world, including, of course, Sasakawa Peace Foundation, the Ocean Policy Research Institute. And then we developed policy recommendations on all aspects of oceans and climate. The central role of oceans and climate, then issues in mitigation, issues in adaptation, issues in financing, and issues in capacity development. A lot of challenges, but it did really make a big difference in two ways. First of all, all the noise and all the political statements, you know, we were able to make contributed to the result that we got a very good legally binding agreement at COP21 and that it was ambitious in the sense that it said we should limit the increase in greenhouse gases to less than uh, two degrees centigrade, but to strive for even lower, 1.5 degrees centigrade. But then second, we got a major word on oceans in the preamble about the need to protect the integrity of all ecosystems, including oceans. And you might think it's not a big deal, but really it's a big deal. It's a big deal to get any word or any comma <laughs> in this kind of a big uh, international agreement. The important part is that we've had global agreement that this is the way to go. And that is very hard to do, you know, to get all of the countries in the world to buy into this. Initially, people who were involved in this negotiating process they tended to uh, have a limited idea about oceans, that it wasn't concerned really with uh, economics and social, because we have three pillars of sustainable development, environment, uh, economy, and social. So the people tended to think that oceans was like a whale protection issue or something like that. So it took a lot of work at the beginning of that process to to demonstrate that oceans is very important economically and socially. We have half of the world's population lives in coastal zones or small island states. You know, 90% of uh, international trade travels by ship in the world's oceans. You know, fisheries is a huge uh, business. We have offshore oil and gas, you name it, you know, so that contributions of oceans to the global economy is huge. Uh, so this was a big process and a you know, big challenge to convince the decision makers that oceans has to be one of the top priorities of the whole world. 
it started with the strong political support of the small island developing states, particularly the Pacific small island states, who argued very strongly for uh, what we call a standalone goal on oceans. Well, it's never enough. You know, what really counts is how do countries implement. So now we have to work with countries to help them implement these goals, uh, these sustainable development goals related to oceans. I think that people really understand generally these issues already around the world. There's great recognition, you know, the small island states understand that if climate change is not curbed, they are going to suffer very, very much. They may not have their countries anymore in the future. By and large, this situation of public understanding has changed tremendously uh, in the last few years. I think what we've seen this week at the symposium that we have had here in Tokyo is that there is already really s extensive scientific information on what are the effects of ocean warming and ocean acidification, you know, what are the projections, and what, will, what might be the impacts on the seafood and on the fishermen and on other people. So I think it's really important now to convey that information to the public. But I think, I think that people really are rational and they need to be informed. And they need, you know, knowledge for them is power. Then if they know what may happen, they can then support measures to avoid the bad things happening. And people do understand now, I think, that we are in the same boat you know, to help people to think about the long term, all they have to think about is their children and grandchildren, you know? That's what we care about. We care for the future, you know. We, we, have, we have the responsibility to ensure a good future for our children and our grandchildren. So I'm, not, I'm, I'm very optimistic. Give people information. They will be rational. They will act. Well, I know mainly the Ocean Policy Research Institute within the Sasakawa Peace Foundation, and they, they're already doing a great job. I mean, they, uh, we have had the pl pleasure of cooperating for a long time and on really big issues like ocean governance globally and in different countries, you know, developing national ocean policies. We have had the pleasure of working on climate and, and oceans and also on advancing the global ocean agenda, like the, the enactment or the adoption of the sustainable development goals. So, you know, I think the OPRI is totally uh, on the right track and already making huge contributions to the global ocean agenda. I think uh, what Mr. Tirashima said at the beginning of the symposium that uh, OPRF used to be a think tank, but now he wants, you know, OPRI to be a think and do tank. So both, you know, analysis and action, I think that is totally perfect for what needs to be done today. <laughs>